good evening, happy new year. Uh, and I'm going to switch right into the English language uh, uh, so that our uh, guests tonight can uh, understand us from the very beginning. It gives me great pleasure to be able to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, my, I think I can say, friend, uh, Matt McCaffrey, uh, a young Austrian scholar, uh, a very promising one. Uh, watch him uh, in the future. Um, uh, he uh, will speak uh, uh, today about uh, uh, the possible uh, application of uh, praxeology as uh, the broad framework of, of Austrian analysis into uh, other areas besides economics. Um, I'm not going, going to steal a great amount of your time. Let me say a few words about him. Then I will give him the floor. He will speak roughly around half an hour or so. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, questions are welcomed. Um, and after a fair amount of time, uh, uh, we will uh, call it off. Uh, Matthew uh, uh, teaches at uh, uh, the University of Illinois uh, at Springfield. Uh, he thought he teaches uh, uh, courses on various uh, economic aspects. Uh, so, uh, many, uh, a few lectures uh, on economic uh, issues. He also teaches uh, an interesting course on what is good. Uh, he also uh, uh, taught at the University of uh, Auburn. Um, he was for a long time associated with the, the Mises Institute in Auburn, uh, in Alabama, um, as he had his research uh, uh, undertaken there. Um, he recently completed his PhD in France at Angers with uh, Professor Guido Hussmann and he, he wrote uh, a thesis on the, the theory of uh, uh, the political economy of, of moral hazard. Uh, he wrote uh, quite a bit on various interesting issues, I recommend uh, uh, his uh, uh, articles to you, on uh, issues like moral hazard, incentives, the theory of entrepreneurship, the theory of political entrepreneurship, uh, history of economic thought, monetary theory, um, uh, history of monetary thought, so on and so forth. And he has very interesting uh, new ideas uh, that he will write about in the future. Uh, so that having been said, let me uh, give the floor to Matt, and uh, I am sure we have a very nice evening together. Matt, please. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, thank you especially to Vlad and Tudor for, uh, for inviting me to give this little lecture um, and to talk about one of my most favorite things in the world, uh, the art of war, which we'll get to. Um, let me say that uh, what I'm talking about tonight is a part of an ongoing research project uh, and a series of papers that I'm developing. Uh, they're in various stages uh, of completion, one of which is forthcoming. Um, that I can certainly send you if you happen to be interested in it. Um, but they tend to deal with, uh, as Vlad said, how we can uh, extend uh, what we call praxeological reasoning uh, to areas in which it, uh, it really hasn't been pushed yet. So um, let me just start with uh, um, the basics of praxeology, as you probably know, uh, is the more general science of human action. Uh, the notion of human purpose that we use as a foundation um, to basically develop uh, all of the social sciences. Uh, economists, uh, or particularly Austrian economists, uh, very often use praxeology almost synonymously with economics. Um, but uh, as Mises, for example, says, uh, economics is merely one branch of, of the broader field of praxeology, although, as he says, uh, it is the best developed branch up to now. Um, and this is of, uh, true just as uh, just now, just as when Mises originally wrote this. Um, but some other people have commented on this as well, about the lack um, of other developed branches of a, a science of human action. Uh, and here we have Rothbard talking about how, um, so talking about some of the other branches um, of praxeology, uh, uh, violent action and interaction. Uh, and of course he mentions uh, the logical theory of war, which is a part of what I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and uh, further after the, uh, uh, continue on in this quote, he also mentions game theory and theories of voting and things like this. Other ways that we can think about human action um, that aren't strictly economic, um, although there may be some overlap, um, as I'll discuss. 
Um, but as he says, the rest of praxeology is an unexplored area, and so um, what I've been interested in recently is uh, applying uh, praxeological ideas to other fields, and in particular, uh, the field of uh, strategy, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, before we get to that, um, uh, I hope this isn't too small um, for people to read, um, but here's a visualization of this notion of, uh, of the sciences of human action, uh, and it includes a distinction made by Mises and others uh, between praxeology and thymology, uh, where thymology is a more about our historical understanding uh, and the empirical world, whereas praxeology deals uh, more uh, with the, the stricter implications of what it means to choose and what it means to have purpose and so on. Um, and so you can um, see the distinction where we have the, the economic subjects on the one hand, um, but of course what we're interested, what I'm interested in uh, talking about tonight um, are these other uh, branches of praxeology that exists in, uh, exist independent of economics. Um, so for example, you have things like uh, uh, praxeological ethics, uh, if, you're, if you're into that sort of thing, um, but also uh, game theory uh, and a theory of war as well. And what I'm going to talk about is, um, in a way, a combination uh, of the game theory aspect and, and the theory of war. Um, I would actually modify this slightly to, um, uh, to include strategy uh, in, a, in, the, in its broadest, most general sense, uh, which would include um, elements of, uh, of game theory, uh, theories of war, and things like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about those um, in a little bit. So the, the motivating question behind this research is that, uh, is, you know, are there universal principles of strategy? Um, if uh, praxeology is universal, and in economics we certainly say that it is, if there are universal economic principles, are there praxeological, other universal principles um, in the other branches of praxeology as well? And we would expect that there would be. So um, if we're talking about strategic decision making, um, can we also uh, draw some inferences about what those principles might look like? Uh, just as a sort of rough and ready definition of strategy uh, as decision making uh, within some situation of conflict or confrontation, uh, a couple of important things to think about when we talk about strategy in its broadest sense. Usually, um, we are talking about some kind of competition, um, and particularly competition between uh, acting, purposive, um, uh, and opposing sides. Uh, it doesn't make too much sense to talk about strategic decision making um, if there's only one person acting. Um, that would fall into some other uh, branch of reasoning. Uh, but in any case, uh, and in addition to, the, to um, the conflict between more than one party, um, it's also very important to note that when we talk about strategy, we have to include both planning and execution uh, of strategies. Uh, just as in economics, uh, we have to always take into account the real world and the fact that um, when we act in the real world, uh, we necessarily um, uh, incur certain costs. Uh, we have to deal with the issue of scarcity, which I'll also talk about. Uh, and basically, you have to take into account uh, the limitations of the real world. Um, it's, it's strategy, uh, like economics, is about more than ideas. Uh, at some point, the ideas have to actually materialize in the real world. Uh, now, related to strategy, um, we'll talk about game theory quickly. So game theory uh, is essentially a branch of strategy in its broadest sense. Um, dealing with very specific types of strategy, usually in the context of uh, very well-defined rules. Um, and, uh, but I will say that um, game theory is a branch of praxeology in the traditional sense um, that Austrian economists have considered it. Uh, Murray Rothbard, for example, in one of his early American Economic Review articles, lists game theory uh, as a branch of praxeology, uh, game theory in the, the way it was uh, developed early on, uh, by John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern. Um, but uh, the problem that Austrian economists have often had with game theory is that it tends to be unrealistic, um, at least when it's applied to economic reasoning. Um, so the usual problems of uh, subjectivity and uncertainty and entrepreneurial behavior, these tend not to have much of a place in game theory. It, it tends to have a, a very difficult time incorporating them. Um, and so for this, and uh, what I'm going to, uh, what I would, uh, 
argue is that you see the same problems emerge in the field of strategy as well, uh, in the sense that if you ever wanted to apply principles of strategic decision making to the real world, you would also have to do away with unrealistic assumptions, like that there are uh, fixed rules of the game that everybody has to act uh, within, uh, which would apply to a restrictive situation, like if you're playing chess or something, they're all about, uh, you can't you know, flip over the board um, and say, I win. Uh, but obviously that, um, that sort of restricted environment uh, doesn't exist in a lot of broader strategic decision-making uh, situations just as it doesn't exist um, in economics. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention also uh, war-making. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, will combine elements of what we might call like a pure strategy um, with the notion of war-making. Um, but war-making would only be one branch of uh, strategic decision-making, along with uh, things like uh, business strategy as well. Um, and, but war-making would uh, uh, concerns the narrower case of uh, armed conflict, um, typically between states. Um, uh, but it is, uh, I just want to point out that it, that it is uh, only one branch of strategic thinking. Although a lot of what I'll talk about tonight, I think, would apply to specific, the specific case of war making. Um, and to just uh, drive this point home, I have a quote here from uh, uh, Joe Salerno, who in, uh, this is actually uh, quite a, uh, a nice article that he uh, published a few years ago. It's a little bit underrated, in my opinion. Um, but who discusses this notion of war making as a, as a purposive behavior. Uh, and the idea that if we ever want to analyze any kind of science of, uh, of war making, uh, any logic of, of how wars take place, we have to begin with the very important point uh, that things like wars and armed conflicts, they're not acts of nature. Um, they are, in fact, the result of, of human choice and human purpose. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, true not only of the narrower case of war making, but also of the broader case of strategy in general. Uh, I think. Uh, with both, we have to begin with some notion of, of human purpose. We have to begin uh, with some notion uh, of uh, a goal to be achieved, um, uh, a greater state of satisfaction that can be obtained through careful strategic decision making. Um, so now we're returning to the question I posed before about uh, sort of universal uh, principles of strategy. Uh, the big problem we face is how can we conceptualize strategic decision making in a way that is basically consistent with uh, praxeology as, as understood by, by Austrian economists. Uh, and the, the, the route that I've taken with this is to look back at some classic works uh, in strategy, particularly in military strategy, and to see if they actually have any insights that seem compatible um, with, uh, with the, the much more recent Austrian tradition in praxeology. And I think that they uh, very often do have very important insights that we can use um, to think about more uh, contemporary problems. Um, so this, uh, this brings me to uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War. Uh, this is, a, just on a personal note, this is one of my favorite books. Um, whenever I think about it, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that Robert Nozick tells in his autobiography where he says that he was about 15 or 16 years old and he um, discovered a copy of Plato's Republic and uh, he said he, he used to carry it around with him in the streets of Brooklyn with the front cover facing out so that everybody could see it. Uh, and he said, uh, I, hadn't, I had read very little of it and I had understood none of it, uh, but I knew that I had found something wonderful. Uh, and I bring this up not to compare myself to Nozick, but to point out that I feel very much the same way about this book. I, I discovered it when I was young, and I, uh, I find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, and so now I'm very happy to be able to incorporate it into my uh, academic research. Um, but just a, a, sort of uh, some background, if you're not familiar with this. Uh, the Art of War, I think, is, is almost universally uh, well known. Uh, it's the most famous of a series of seven military classics that are regarded as canonical uh, in the ancient Chinese literature. Uh, and it's, it's uh, enjoyed an enormous uh, influence in both China and Japan, in both uh, the market business context and the military conflict uh, uh, area. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's been, been highly influential. Um, and it's also uh, experienced uh, um, a sort of a renaissance 
um, at least the United States, in business culture, um, particularly in the 1980s when uh, uh, Japanese business culture was starting to uh, appear more in the United States because, of course, at the time they were going through a very big economic boom. Um, but they brought with them a lot of sort of cultural aspects of their business, and so uh, the American businessmen tried to sort of emulate many of the ideas that were circulating in their business culture, uh, many of which relate um, to these, uh, these uh, uh, strategic classics. Uh, just on a historical note, the, the text itself, it's, it's attributed to about the late 6th century BC. It's very old. Like a lot of these historical texts, um, there's a huge disagreement among scholars about when it was actually written, uh, or more accurately, when it was compiled, because uh, a lot of the records are very sketchy, and it's extremely unlikely that the, uh, the man we know as the historical Sun Tzu um, actually wrote this text. More likely, it was uh, compiled later by his disciples. Um, and uh, partly because of this uh, uh, confused um, historical record, uh, and, and because the text was uh, likely compiled over the course of a, a relatively long period of time, um, it has a lot of philosophical influences, um, some of which conflict with each other. Uh, in general, though, the, the scholarly consensus is that um, the book is most heavily influenced by philosophical Taoism. Uh, it is not what you would call a Taoist text, uh, but there are very important elements in it um, which can be uh, linked to, to Taoist philosophy, particularly ideas about how uh, strategy must be uh, infinitely adaptable, uh, even formless, like water. This is a uh, theme that occurs prominently in the Tao. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, the kan what uh, has become the canonical version of it um, that we have today uh, is, does seem to be very much uh, within this tradition. So I thought it was important to, uh, to bring that up. Now, um, contrary to the name of the text, or the received name, uh, Art of War is actually not so much about uh, practical military matters um, as it is a much broader explanation of the essence uh, of strategy. Uh, what it really tries to get at is, is not so much the the minor points of how you maneuver on a battlefield or how you arrange troops and things like that. What it really is about is a series of very general, in fact, universal principles uh, that are capable of describing uh, effectively any conceivable strategic situation. And the idea is that if you understand these principles and if you are capable of applying them uh, to the situations where they are relevant, uh, the victory, whatever that might mean, whatever specific context you're working in, uh, is always achievable. Um, and the key is to, uh, to make conditions uh, uh, conducive um, to victory by carefully uh, analyzing them um, and, again, carefully applying a series of principles, some of which I'll talk about. Uh, I would also point out that uh, within this uh, context, um, as I said, uh, there are notions of adaptability and formlessness and so on. The reason the, uh, those are there is because the text emphasizes very much that the conditions in which strategy is formed are always open-ended. They're always in continual flux. Uh, and I've used some, uh, some uh, of the military examples here, uh, things like information and uh, the morale of the troops, the morale of your own troops, as, we'll, uh, as I'll discuss. Uh, Self-knowledge is also a very important part of this. Um, but all of these different characteristics, uh, these different conditions that can uh, go into forming a strategy, uh, constantly change. And so you have to uh, be capable of perceiving that change before it happens, anticipating it, uh, in order to form your own strategy uh, and hopefully best your opponent. Um, so that's, this is just a little uh, uh, sort of a brief general description uh, of what the book's all about. So now I'll talk about uh, some of the more specific principles. I should point out that I, I do have to make a caveat. Um, when you compare uh, a book like Art of War to contemporary uh, Austrian economics uh, and praxeology, um, of course, uh, these two different texts come from very different epistemological, philosophical traditions. Um, so it wouldn't be quite right uh, to describe Sun Tzu as a sort of proto-praxeologist and say that he was anticipating these ideas. 
The traditions are very different. Um, but what I want to argue is, is that they are similar enough on the essentials um, that we can draw some, some interesting analogies um, that do tell us something. Um, but uh, let me say that uh, Sun Tzu actually starts, when talking about strategy in a general sense, he starts from a very similar uh, place uh, as economists do, that is with the idea of scarcity. Um, he's very focused on the idea that executing any strategy, um, even the strategy of basically doing nothing, requires the use of scarce resources. And human and physical resources are always necessary. Um, because as I mentioned before, when we talk about strategy, we have to talk about behavior in the real world. We're not just talking about sort of spinning out abstract ideas. Um, there's, there's uh, the abstract in strategy really doesn't matter much. What matters is when decisions are actually made uh, and become concrete. Um, but in any case, uh, as I said, the, the vital details of any uh, process of forming and executing a strategy uh, always take place in the context of scarcity, and this is something uh, Sun Tzu is very interested in. Um, of course, scarcity, it always limits our, our, our potential, right? Um, uh, because if you have, uh, because all the, the relevant details, again, are always going to be scarce. Um, it's not the case that you can make an abstract movement against an opponent. Rather, again, in returning to the military context, uh, you have to, say, uh, deploy a very specific number and disposition of troops at a very specific place at a very specific time. Again, once again, it's, it's, uh, it's all about resource use uh, and carefully uh, managing one's scarce resources. Uh, interestingly, um, there is actually a very strong uh, entrepreneurial element in the way Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu describes how to, to formulate good strategy. Uh, what he says, um, he talks quite a bit about how to uh, creatively get around these seeming limitations that scarcity imposes on us. Um, and uh, I, I talk about this uh, in a, a forthcoming paper, this sort of entrepreneurial element, how much he emphasizes uh, the creativity and the innovation that are constantly required um, to get around scarcity, particularly when your opponent is not equally creative uh, and doesn't see, doesn't perceive the same opportunities you do. Um, uh, to take advantage of, of the, the conditions uh, on the battlefield. Uh, I've sort of mentioned some of this already, uh, but there is a very, there's a distinctly economic point of view in, in Art of War. Uh, the vast majority of it revolves around, again, resource management, how to very carefully uh, husband scarce resources. Um, in fact, in one of the opening chapters, the second chapter, which is titled Waging War, uh, in fact deals almost not at all with any sort of practical military problem. It's all about uh, the costs of war, uh, and particularly how to uh, manage those costs such as not, so as to not bankrupt the state uh, in the, uh, through a, a process of careless, um, careless warfare or, or uh, indefinite warfare extended campaigns and so on. Um, but this notion of the, the economic point of view, I think it's summed up nicely in this quote when he says that uh, the essence of good strategy, the essence of, of fighting, is preservation. And there are certain reasons for that. Um, as I said, this is a, a more, uh, it's a, since the text is influenced by Taoism, there's a certain notion for a respect for life. Um, so it's good to preserve resources in that sense. Also, there's a practical uh, problem here, which is that if you destroy your enemy, uh, whether it be the enemy's army or fortified cities or whatever, you're destroying exactly what you're supposed to be capturing. Uh, and Pyrrhic victories for Sun Tzu are, are not really victories at all. Uh, the conclusion that he reaches uh, from this, and it's one of the most important ideas that comes out of Art of War, is that the highest goal of any strategy, uh, particularly in the military context, is to win without actually fighting. Uh, the notion is that if a strategy is, uh, is excellent enough uh, and can be uh, put into practice in just the right way, uh, it can be so effective that an opponent is simply unable to make any sort of counter move uh, and, and is defeated before any sort of fight actually begins. Uh, and I, I, I love this line. Uh, a lot uh, when he says that all I need to do is draw a line on the ground and defend it. Because uh, the idea being that um, if strategy is so perfect, 
There's just nothing an opponent can do. You, you don't need fortifications uh, if, uh, if your enemy has been so limited by your strategic decision making uh, that he can't leave his own uh, country or can't engage you in battle or, or what have you. Uh, but once again, the theme uh, of preservation is, is really dominant in the art of war, and I think it, it fits nicely uh, with how we think of, uh, of economics. Right. Um, so the next big uh, point uh, of art of war is knowledge. In fact, it's probably the, the most common idea that you see repeated again and again in the text. Uh, the notion of, of possessing the right knowledge, uh, what, we, what we might call the, uh, the particular knowledge of time and place. Um, that's what strategy is about. Uh, because again, we're always dealing with the real world where time is scarce, where resources are scarce. Uh, and thus, what is a good strategy today may not be a good strategy tomorrow uh, because the conditions in which we form strategy are constantly changing. Uh, this is the most famous quotation from the Art of War, actually. Thus it is said that one who knows the enemy and knows himself will not be endangered in a hundred engagements. And I think it sums up the principle uh, quite well. Um, but also notice uh, that there is a distinct emphasis on the fact that knowledge isn't just a knowledge of external things. It's not just a knowledge of what one's opponent is doing. Well, uh, Self-knowledge is absolutely vital. It's indispensable. Um, because if you do not have, if you do, obviously if you do not possess self-knowledge, uh, you have absolutely no idea what you have to offer against an, a strategic opponent. Uh, and of course, when I talk about knowledge, as it says here, um, it's much deeper than simply uh, gathering data, crunching numbers, and so on. Um, and this comes back to the entrepreneurial element, or what I call the entrepreneurial element, um, that it involves a, a much deeper perception of what's going on in the world, um, of uh, the availability of resources, how they can be used uh, in very special ways to, uh, to stymie an opponent, and so on. Um, related to this, this is actually more of a minor uh, thing, but uh, the use of spies is also a very important um, part of this. Uh, Art of War is actually the, the oldest known historical work that contains an analysis of spies and their importance and how to use spies. Um, this is an idea that uh, comes up a lot in the sort of business literature that's grown up around art of war. Uh, the metaphor of using spies in business for like industrial espionage and things like that. Uh, we don't have to take the metaphor that far, um, but just to point out that uh, um, I think some of the a function like spying um, can be absolutely vital for obtaining information that leads to uh, greater knowledge about one's, uh, what one's opponent is doing. Um, and, and in fact, Sun Tzu's uh, explanation of this in his in the, it's the final chapter of the Art of War uh, is quite prescient in the sense that he understands uh, the many risks of using spies because he understands that spies can be turned and turned again, and so he understands that the value uh, of the spy is greatly going to depend um, not just on the knowledge that he possesses, um, but on your expectations about the spy's behavior and whether or not your opponent will turn the spy and so on. Um, I find it fascinating, he goes into a great deal of detail about this. Um, but the notion of uh, spying gets us to uh, the flip side of knowledge, which is deception, another uh, very important, very quoted um, theme from Art of War. Um, about, uh, and it, uh, of course, if, if knowledge does play a significant role in forming a good strategy, well then, sort of non-knowledge, anti-knowledge, uh, for one's opponent is also going to play a, a pretty big role. Um, as I said, what I was trying to get at here is that um, if you have a situation uh, like, say, perfect information in economics, uh, but if in strategy, if you have a situation where knowledge is complete or perfect in some sense, uh, what that does is really um, cause inaction uh, in a way. Um, what you end up describing is simply a static state where nothing can really change. Because if both sides know everything there is to know, there's really not much you can do, right? Um, you can either, uh, either you get stuck in inaction or, in, say, in a military con uh, uh, context, you end up sort of mindlessly um, pursuing conflict even when it uh, doesn't make much sense. But so, um, so in order to uh, manipulate the situation, you have to be able to manipulate information 
uh, for your opponent uh, and deceive your opponent constantly, uh, keep the enemy on its toes, so to speak, uh, by feeding them misinformation about what you're doing uh, and how you're doing it. Uh, again, returning to a sort of entrepreneurial idea, uh, the, the twin notions of knowledge and deception uh, also imply uh, the sort of mutual adjustment of plans and expectations between opponents. Both sides are constantly in this process of trying to gather information and prevent deception, uh, while at the same time encouraging exactly the opposite uh, with their opponent. Um, so this is the sort of uh, um, uh, element of pure strategy uh, that, that, uh, that describes uh, conflicting uh, uh, intentions of, uh, of opposing parties. Next, uh, the notion of unorthodox strategy. This is a, um, it's a, actually a vital part of the art of war, although it is not quoted as much uh, as some of the other passages. Uh, but Sun Tzu draws a really important distinction, and, and this is another, uh, this is a distinction that has a very long history uh, in Chinese military and business affairs. Um, the distinction between these twin concepts, unorthodox and orthodox, that's how they've been translated, uh, like many of these ancient concepts uh, from Eastern philosophy. They're basically impossible to translate, but this is what the best we've come up with uh, for the moment. Uh, but you can see um, with, through these characteristics how they might play into um, strategy. The idea being that uh, the use of an unorthodox strategy uh, will always be superior um, to the use uh, of an orthodox one. Uh, the orthodox, because it is so expected, because it is conventional, um, is also very easy to defend against. Um, it's very easy to account for, but to be unorthodox uh, is to defy expectations, uh, to get around them, um, and thus, hopefully, um, to achieve some kind of victory. Um, these two concepts, they have a very interesting relationship to each other. Uh, as it says, uh, any situation of conflict uh, and strategy and decision-making has its orthodox and unorthodox aspects. Um, any situation can be perceived, according to Sun Tzu, um, as, as both of these things. And more importantly, uh, the two change constantly. Once again, as people's knowledge and expectations are updated, uh, the orthodox becomes the unorthodox and vice versa. So the first time you use uh, uh, you know, a, a daring battlefield tactic, uh, you, you might be able to win the day, but after that, its effects are going to be much lower because your opponent will simply expect it. But then... Uh, Maybe the, uh, the sort of strategy that was originally very conventional becomes unexpected and becomes orthodox, or I'm sorry, becomes unorthodox, uh, and so can be effectively used in a strategic situation. So once again, um, like the, as I said, the, the relationship between these two concepts is um, quite complex, uh, but it's very important. Uh, and again, it's an attempt by Sun Tzu to get at a sort of a universal principle uh, of strategy. Uh, that can be applied to any situation. Um, so those, uh, I've only quoted a few passages and I've only talked about a few principles. I, I, I could have spoken uh, for much longer, but I think it's more profitable to, uh, um, to leave it here. But uh, what I want to emphasize with this is that uh, I do think that some of these great classics of strategy have a lot to say about uh, strategic decision making in a more universal sense, in a sense that's not the same as, but is compatible with praxeology as the Austrian economists have conceived of it. Um, I do think there's a lot to learn from this. Again, I only talked about art of war. Uh, I Even within uh, the Chinese military tradition, I could have talked about a number of other texts uh, to say nothing of the Japanese, uh, to say nothing of the Germans, uh, the British, and, and the, the other um, nations. Uh, strategic traditions that have produced really important works. Um, but uh, again, I would like to, to focus on the, uh, the fact that the principles I talked about, they can be linked to the notion of purposive behavior. Once we start with the idea um, that there was some sort of uh, confrontation or conflict that we want to advantageously resolve through a careful strategy, uh, a lot of these principles come very naturally. Uh, the idea uh, of knowing more than your opponent does, uh, the idea of deceiving your opponent uh, and behaving in an unorthodox fashion. Uh, these come quite easily, I think, um, to strategic thinking. 
Uh, and as a last point, again, uh, the principles that are outlined in books like Art of War, um, such that deception is a very important aspect uh, of strategy, those are in a sense simple, and in fact they're almost trivial. Um, they're, they're not really news to anybody. But the key point is understanding how they can be applied to each particular situation, understanding which principles apply at each very specific time, uh, anticipating that, and being able to uh, then apply a particular principle in a particular time and place. Um, so that's the, really the great challenge of strategy uh, in, in, uh, in Sun Tzu's view. Um, but with that, I think I'll just uh, I'll leave it at that, and um, uh, I hope I, I managed to make some sense out of this. Um, but uh, if you don't mind, I'll uh, answer some questions. Yeah. Let me moderate uh, uh, questions. And uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, yes, please. Uh, first there, there's a first one I saw, and then the second there. I have a curiosity. Yeah. Louder, please. I have a curiosity. I'm not familiar with the meaning mm. or something like that. But uh, how, I, I mean, you find this uh, keyword, uh, strategies, but it's not quite exactly what you find in uh, theory of war. I mean, when I'm speaking about strategies in game theory, I'm thinking about payoffs, about interrupting games and stuff like that that are more mathematical. And I don't know how you make that connection with the theory of war and strategies. I mean, maybe you have the same word but two different meanings, or it's my, I misunderstood. That. So, what's the difference between game theory strategy and axiological yes, yes, strategy? If it's maybe. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. So, um, I think the idea is that uh, all of the uh, game theory, war making, strategy in the broadest sense, um, they all share some overlap, but they all have also some distinct characteristics. Um, but the thing is, uh, what unites them, or at least in my view, is the notion of human purpose. Um, that's what they all share in common. So, for example, it is very true that a uh, conventional game theory approach, uh, especially in mathematical economics, is not what you would see um, in practical military decisions in wartime. However, uh, I think if you think about them within the broader framework of praxeology, you realize that there is actually overlap. Be and, and as I said, the, the key point is human purpose. Because whether you're uh, playing chess or solving a prisoner's dilemma or making war uh, or uh, engaging in strategic management, in all cases, you, uh, we're talking about action, we're talking about purpose and choice with the uh, ultimate goal of some uh, increased welfare or obtaining something, um, somehow improving our position. So, only one back and forth, it's okay. Once. Okay, do you think that there is some kind of a path to, to a goal, actually, both the strategies and game theory and the theory of the world? Okay, uh, again, also interesting, like, I think that the way mathematical economics uses strategy, no, uh, the way that it is currently conceived of, no, it would not be um, quite a part of this, although there might be some overlap. Um, the reason being that uh, most game theoretic approaches in economics have this sort of static element to them, where the payoffs are fixed, uh, and both parties presumably know something about the payoffs, and so on. Um, and really, strategy, uh, um, in the economic sense, is already implied in the conditions of the problem. Once you've, co once you've constructed the conditions of the problem, you know what the optimal strategy is, right? And hence, uh, uh, the emergence of optimal equilibria. But again, it's, it's static in the sense that there's not this constantly changing uh, environment in which you need to make decisions. There's not, there's not an uncertain environment. Um, so yeah, so but yes, I mean I I see what you're getting at, and there are different meanings of this this term strategy. So yeah. Uh, the next question. Uh, I want to add a I want to ask you if you got to read the own word by Carlos Clausewitz, and uh, if yes, uh, if uh, we could uh, if we could make a link between the concept of the puzzle of words 
with concepts of the Hebrew habits. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's actually some. Um, as far as. You did the first time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is actually some, uh, some literature on this. As far as Clausewitz is concerned, I think on war is a little bit. It's a little bit more practical than Sun Tzu is, because as I said, as I was trying to emphasize, Sun Tzu was really about the broader principles of war in the broadest sense, whereas I think Clausewitz is narrower um, and wants to talk more about details, like technological details, uh, logistical details um, of his particular time period. Um, so I, I think that he is probably less useful for this um, than Sun Tzu is. Um, but I do think that uh, there's value uh, in what he wrote, and he also is what uh, in the liter what they call in the literature grand theories of war. Clausewitz has them too. Um, so there is so there is a relationship um, between here that's worth exploring. He was also very interested in the notion of time and things like that um, that we can make uh, with, with which we can make comparisons not only to Sun Tzu but to economics as well. So as far as the invisible hand <laughs> itself is concerned. Um, I'm not sure I see a specific connection. No. Other questions, please? Um, that going back to your slide on deception, you said mm -hmm. that if you know if you know your opponent completely and the opponent knows you completely, uh, that's undesirable because it can uh, lead either to no action or direct conflict. Mm -hmm. But let's uh, take an example for for example, there's uh, side A, which is um, completely strong from all points of view, and mm -hmm. side B, uh, who is very, very weak. I, I would dare to say that uh, for side A, uh, uh, this complete knowledge uh, uh, of your opponent and uh, them knowing you completely is very advantageous because it can lead to that situation where you have no conflict, but you win. You, have no, you don't fight. You why, why That's an excellent question, actually. The reason is because it comes back, especially to the notion of the orthodox and the unorthodox. Because for Sun Tzu, there's basically no such thing as a hopeless situation. If you are effective enough, you can find your way out of, uh, out of trouble. And in fact, not just in the art of war, but in many of the Chinese military classics, they spend a lot of time talking about sort of impossible situations. So what if we're outnumbered and we're surrounded and the terrain is terrible and so on and so forth. Um, so the idea is um, that uh, if both sides have complete knowledge, they would also have knowledge of these orthodox and unorthodox strategies, for example. Um, and so they would still um, uh, be forced either to like mindlessly attack each other or simply do nothing, uh, precisely because even the small opponent has available strategies that could bring about victory. Okay, so there's so. no, uh, uh, if you can't beat them, join them, uh, course of action in this situation. Well, um, uh, cooperation is also possible. That is that is among the strategies, um, or at least uh, cooperation, assuming there are more than two opponents. Mm -hmm. um, for the I mean, sort of, uh, um, for pedagogical reasons, I guess you might say. Um, in a case where there are only two appointed opponents, they don't talk about cooperation because it's just kind of assumed that if you could cooperate, you would be doing it already. Um, so the only kind of cooperation that comes out of a situation with two opponents would be <laughs> when one side has effectively um, defeated or cowed the other side um, into submission. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So I have more of curiosity than a question. I, I observe that. Uh, Usually, Austrian economics say that perhaps theology is a much broader science than, mm -hmm. uh, than economics. But the, the curious thing is that the, the only relevant findings out there, perhaps theology as a science, uh, has is in are in the realm of economics. So we have cycle theory, we have um, calculation theory, which are things which are not trivial and are much much further, uh, much more complex than just saying that. Um, people act and uh, this is for yeah. physical behavior. So, uh, of course, I, I, I don't, don't want to say that practice cannot be applied in other domains than economics, but I'm curious whether if we apply it, we have relevant 
uh, findings like like the ones we have in economics. Or more specific theoretical implications. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Theorems. Yeah. Not, not <coughs> yeah. I, I think it's a, I think it's an excellent question, and I actually agree with you that it is. I mean, economics is the so-called best developed branch of praxeology precisely because it's the easiest to spin out, uh, as you said, non-trivial substantive implications about the world. Um, but I do think that it can be applied in other realms as well. Um, for example, um, to take the uh, the branch of strategy dealing with like business management. Uh, or business strategy, a strategic management, strategic entrepreneurship, and things like that. I think we can get some interesting things out of those uh, um, out of those branches, and it's precisely because they contain so much more than, as you said, the trivial implications that everybody talks about, like people act, and so we're always trying to improve our situations and so on, like the very basic thing ideas that people associate with praxeology. But of course, it's so it is so much more than that. Um, but I do think that it is a, sort of a great undiscovered country um, that we can get things out of. Yeah. Okay, so some other questions? I have uh, two in store, oh. so maybe you figure out others. Um, the first question would be, um, uh, when I think about Rothbard, speaking in the ethics of liberty, in foreign liberty, and in a few other articles, when he speaks about strategy, he mostly has in mind the idea, the political idea, of switching from a relatively more statist society to a relatively more uh, non-statist or private property order like uh, a society. Um, uh, is there any um, connection or parallel or overlapping or relation between his way of seeing strategy and, and your way of, of, of seeing it? And if so, what um, uh, what could we learn from studying strategy, praxeological strategies such as exposed by, explained by Sun Tzu, uh, to apply in a strategy to, for freedom, let's say, for, yeah. for more freedom? It, it's another great question, and I actually uh, have a working paper on exactly this topic, although I, I, I don't finish it because on some level I feel like I'm not old enough to be talking about telling other people what this great strategy for liberty should be. Um, but I'm still writing the paper anyway. Uh, but I, I do actually think that there are, um, that this does tell us, um, or it can tell us, a lot about um, strategies for liberty, um, if, if, if for no other reason than that it can tell us about strategies that won't be effective. Um, and uh, um, so just to take a couple of different examples, um, the focus on, on scarcity, right? Uh, in any strategy for liberty, we have to look at the resources available to both sides. Obviously, the more liberty-oriented side uh, not only has fewer resources, but its resources are actually siphoned off and then used against it by the more statist side, right? So this sort of implication, I mean, it, like it's, it's absolutely vital to think about it like this way. So one, um, and I think we can use these ideas to, to get at the notion of um, entrepreneurial strategy and how we can get around those resource constraints. That would be one example. Um, another favorite um, that I've been thinking about is the notion of the use of spies, right? Like, uh, I'm not sure exactly what a, a spy would be like uh, in the context of a struggle for liberty. Maybe we spend uh, liberals into government to you know report back. A professor in the state university. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's interesting you bring up that example, though, because why? Because I think Sun Tzu actually has the answer for why we don't do that or why we shouldn't do that, and it's because spies can be turned. And uh, so I'm sure you can appreciate the, <laughs> the relevant analogy. But but again, it, it's um, it's a simple insight, but it's a very important, right? It should explain why. Um, it doesn't make sense to, uh, again, uh, I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but why it might not make sense to, you know, train uh, economists to go and, uh, you know, become a member of board of, uh, on the board of a central bank and sort of report back to us um, precisely because uh, in order to get there, it, you pretty much have to guarantee that you've already been turned in a way. Um, so again, just sort of a the calculus involved in that. But I think there are a number of other ways you can um, uh, think about this sort of strategy in terms of a strategy for liberty as well, um, both in terms of positive, what we should do, and negative, uh, the strategies we really need to avoid. So.
my, my second question is related to uh, this Lopardian theory of aggression, mm -hmm. which uh, would make uh, someone <coughs> uncomfortable, uncomfortable to make a parallel between, let's say, business strategy, yeah. in which you always have to use, let's say, peaceful means, mm -hmm. and uh, war making, uh, in which anything is accepted yeah. uh, in the end. So what uh, lessons can you draw from war making for uh, business strategy? If in one, in the in war making, aggression is acceptable, uh, you can kill people, you can torture people, you can strangle people, you can deceive people to the fullest extent possible, and business strategy where you can do lots of things but not aggressive, right. which limits your, your, your means very much. Yeah, again, another good question. And I, the, uh, this is why I emphasize the difference that strategy, uh, in the broader sense, isn't quite the same as uh, war making or strategy for war making. Um, I think the way to think about it is that, um, especially historically, a lot of people have thought about applying this text to business in the wrong way. That is, they conceive of this text as being fundamentally about war, and they say, how can we apply the theory of, of actual aggressive war to peaceful business? Um, but I think that's a mistake, and I think that uh, a better way to think about it would be to think about uh, this as strategy in the broad sense, which again has different branches. Um, so it's not the case that the principles of war actually apply to business strategy. It's that the, the broader principles of strategy can apply uh, in both a business and a war fair context. So. Some other questions? Maybe? Okay. Ah, Trudeau, please. Okay, so I, my uh, question would be related to uh, how, how would you uh, comment on um, how is this, uh, let's say, strategy or military strategy or more specifically what Sun Tzu is uh, commenting in, in the art of war. So how is this related to uh, calculated action? So to, uh, to ca the kind of uh, enterprise that needs uh, market prices. Why am I asking this? Because I'm, I'm, relating, to, uh, I'm relating it to uh, what Mises has to say about um, economic calculation under socialism. So in the case yeah. you have a, a military action, you uh, do, do you presuppose that there are prices there or not? And if not, uh, how can you still uh, act in a, in a very uh, large, let's say, uh, manner? Uh, yeah. Uh, how, how, how come you, uh, you make something on a large scale and uh, long term? Yeah, it's a good, and again, good question. And I'm not just saying that because it is a good question. Um, but this is actually something I talk about in my fourth, uh, forthcoming paper on the art of war. Um, because, the, as you said, it's correct. Like military action, or at least in the context of a state, occurs outside the sphere of economic calculation. Um, and it's, uh, even though, of course, Sun Tzu was writing millennia before those terms were conceived, uh, what he does spend a lot of time talking about are the principles of organization. And basically, he comes to uh, the conclusions that modern uh, management theory has reached, which is that uh, when you don't have prices to guide you, you need to rely on incentives, specifically uh, complex and properly organized schemes of reward and punishment, um, from the, like all through the, the military hierarchy. Um, because that's because that's what you have to rely on, um, and it's it's also very clear in the art of war that that is imperfect. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean I, I think it's a, a prescient insight, even though of course he, he lacked any kind of knowledge about what economic calculation is and so on. Um, but yeah, it, it's about uh, the internal organization of whatever it might be the military or maybe the firm, um, but but the notion of the, the careful arrangement of incentives. Any other questions? <laughs> if not, we can wrap it up here. Thank you, Matt, very much. If you have anything to add? No, I don't, I don't think so. So, but I thank you all again for coming, and this is very interesting, and I'm very um, happy to uh, to talk with any of you about this. If you want to talk about it after or anything like that, so I'd be more than welcome. But thank you all for coming. I do very much appreciate thank it. You so. Very much.